Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, February 26th, 2020. Now, if this is your first time checking out this show, thank you for being here and welcome. If not, thank you also for being here. But you've probably heard me say at least once and probably multiple times how I see when people refer to their rights by amendment number, it makes my skin crawl. For example, even this almost kind of endorsement from Chuck Norris for the 10th Amendment Center. He wrote this back 10 years ago, back in 2010 specifically. I would encourage you to go to the 10th Amendment Center and learn more about your 10th Amendment rights and then fight for those rights by holding all your representatives accountable to them. He encouraged people to learn about their 10th Amendment rights. Now, this type of a viewpoint is very common. It's very common whether it's 10th or 1st or 4th or 2nd Amendment. People refer to their rights by amendment number, but it's also totally wrong. None of the founders, none of the old revolutionaries thought like this at all. So today in this episode, I want to give a very brief introduction to natural rights. Just a very brief intro to that and provide you guys with some additional reading if you want to learn more. But I also want to share with you quotes from uh, about a dozen or 13 leading founders and revolutionaries that focus on the fact that rights are not gifts from government. First of all, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. We have a bunch of live streaming video platforms. That's YouTube, Facebook, DLive, Periscope, and Twitch. We have a number of archive channels for video, BitChute, BitTube.tv, Brighteon.com. And we just started uh, uploading to Library.tv. It's blockchain run by a guy that I, I just found out who runs it. Mike Vine is one of the people who has co-founded this. And I've worked with Mike a number of times over the years. In fact, he is the guy who booked me to speak as a keynote, a backup, as the backup guy, the pinch hitter for Lou Rockwell for Porkfest 10. So I'm excited about the product even more knowing who's behind it. We also have audio-only podcast editions. That's Apple, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, Podbean, and elsewhere. You can find all of our archives, all of the show notes, links that I reference, ways to follow us, ways to support us like two bucks a month for a membership program that we make go a long, long way here over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. All spelled out again, 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. And before getting to all the good stuff, I want to say hi to everyone out in the live chat. I'm very grateful for you spending some time with me today. And if you can't make it live, that's cool too. Don't feel ever feel bad about it. This is a weird time to be broadcasting, but it works great for me. So hello to Elaine Garcia on YouTube, Essential Freedom, Patricia Dance, Heather Rossi, Melody Skamen, Tyler B, Anna Rays, Matt Tobor, Timothy Martin, and everyone else. MRGF78, Andrew Nappy says, Second Amendment rights. Chris Regan, or Reagan, I apologize if I get that wrong. Loic, Brilliant, Brilliant Radiance. What a cool name. Over on Facebook, Clayton, Aaron, Shane Lackey, Justin, Raphael, Alan Hughes, uh, Shane again, Dan Reed from Culinary Libertarian Podcast. Good to see you guys. Uh, again, I'm very grateful for you joining me. And let's get into this instead of hearing me just chit-chat and ramble on. First of all, an introduction to natural rights. And I think a really good place for you to go check out, not necessarily Chuck Norris, I'm pulling that up here again, but this page over at the Online Library of Liberty. This is a great resource for original documents and essays, and you find books and papers and things like that. We've used this many, many times as links in our show notes. They have a landing page that they set up here, kind of a home page to explain natural law and natural rights. Now, interestingly enough, as I've personally grown and learned over the years, first I started kind of just learning, well, I really started when I first started learning about the founders and the Constitution in some pre-revolutionary times. John Adams was one of the first people that I read, and his stuff early on in the 1760s and 1770s was really awesome before he uh, went to uh, sour, we'll call it. I also read a lot of the Anti-Federalist Papers. There's a compilation by a guy named Bruce Fronin, I believe, who did an early on collection 
of the Anti-Federalist Papers. But as I've gotten better and better and I've expanded my knowledge in this, I feel like I have to keep going further back. So I've spent a lot of time learning about ratification debates, uh, the Philadelphia Convention. And I've got a lot to do on that yet the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, but then I also have to understand, well, where did they get these principles from? Because the founders didn't just make this stuff up out of nowhere. I'm not making this stuff up out of nowhere. We're basically building on learned experience and learned knowledge, maybe expanding, coming up with some new ideas out of it. But the founders had a lot of people that they learned from as well. Uh, back through the interim period between the Articles and the Constitution's ratification. Before that, the Revolutionary Period, the Pre-Revolutionary Period, and even much further back than that as well. And here over at Online Library of Liberty, I will include this link in the show notes, they put it this way. One of the intellectual traditions which stands behind modern classical liberalism is that of natural law and natural rights. This tradition emerged in the 17th and 18th century and argues that the world is governed by natural laws which are discoverable by human reason. This is something that really informed the way the founders, the revolutionaries, had approached the system of government and their problems with the king. Going further, it says, human beings, because of their particular natures, have a number of natural rights, or what Tom Thomas Paine, no one called him Tom at the time, just like no one called Samuel Adams, Sam Adams, Thomas Paine described as imprescriptible rights. That was in the rights of man in, I think, 1792, 1795, somewhere around there. A key aspect of this intellectual tradition is the notion that natural rights are not created by government, but exist anterior to it. I've often cited John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution. I think I've got him in this list today. Let me just take a look at my notes. Yeah, yeah, uh, where this is just, when you put things in a document, you're just declaring things that existed with or without government. So you would have the right to defend yourself. You have the right to property, to your own thoughts, whether government gives you permission to or not, whether words on paper happen to agree with that or not, whether a court happens to give you a permission slip on this or not. The fact of the matter is, is when government does agree with you, obviously it's much better for liberty because it's much harder to fight, for example, what we live under, the most powerful empire in the history of the world. But going further, they say during the 19th century, 1800s, the natural law, natural rights tradition was overtaken by English utilitarianism. This is basically what we have today, which argued that the government should pursue policies which would do the greatest good for the greatest number. And that's basically what drives almost anybody who gets involved in government these days. They can make the case, and you can basically make the case for anything because if you can argue, well, this is good for this group or this group or this number of people, then there is no limitation on power. And that's why we want to focus and push people to reject this notion of my First Amendment rights, my Second Amendment rights, and focus on the fact that you have a natural right and it is inherent because you are a person. It is your birthright. So this page, and I'm just kind of going on and on on this, has some really interesting links and titles to some of the people uh, they also have Lysander Spooner in there, who I've covered on this show, talking about, for example, a tri his p great paper on the trial by jury. But some of the people that inform the thought of the founders, like Grotius, Locke, Puffendorf, very few people go further back than the 1760s and down to 17, early 1700s. Samuel Adams, sometimes I cover his writings from the uh, 1740s, for example, but then also went to the mid uh, mid 17th century. One of the few people that do this on a regular basis is my buddy Joe Wolverton, who's a longtime writer for the New American magazine. He's written for us a number of times here at the Tenth Amendment Center. He just finished a book that I have handy right here. What degree of madness? James Madison's method to make America states again. I encourage you to get that. That's a little sales pitch for my buddy's book. But not a lot of people actually go deep into this foundational principle history. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. And one of the great books that you could also read on this, let me pull this up, is they call it the best single volume on the origins on, of the Constitution, Norvis Ordo Seclorum, the intellectual or origins of the Constitution. This is from the mid-80s from the great Forrest MacDonald. And basically... 
he pointed out that this Lockean natural rights theory was really useful and helpful for people who wanted to legitimize severance or secession from the kingdom of Great Britain or from the empire with Great Britain. And one example of that we see from somebody who became one of the worst status of that time is Alexander Hamilton. But early on, and Mike Meharry did a short video on this recently where he talks about, you know, Hamilton was basically Jekyll and Hyde on the one hand. And you may say the same thing about John Adams, too. When it was time for the revolution or in arguing for limited power under the Constitution, Hamilton said a lot of really incredible stuff, stuff that no politician today would even be close to him on. But then once he had power or once that whole situation was done, he flip flopped. I think Hamilton was just a self-interested narcissist, maybe a, some kind of a socio, who knows. But this is something that he wrote that was pretty good in 1775. He said the sacred rights, and he was making the case that natural rights were one of the reasons for the revolution. And that's basically what Forrest MacDonald, one of the arguments that he's making on the intellectual origins in that great book. He said, the sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. Hamilton got this right. Why can't politicians today? Because Hamilton was the worst at that time. They are written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature. Man, that's dramatic by the hand of the divinity itself and can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. And I will link to that as well. This is Hamilton talking about the right of revolution in on February 23rd, 1775. But let's go a little bit further back. And I think one of the earlier kind of leading to the revolutionary revolution tracks or texts came from James Otis in 1764 titled The Rights of the British colonists proved the rights of British colonists proved. And this was in 1764. Here's how he put it. He was asking some questions about different types of the ways that government is given legitimacy. And one of the questions that he talked about when you look at it as a compact or an agreement, he says, is not every man born as free by nature as his father? Has he not the same natural right to think and act and contract for himself? Is it possible for a man to have a natural right to make a slave of himself or of his posterity? I think Rothbard may have had some interesting conversations in one of his books many years later. He goes on, are not women born as free as men? The idea that there was inequality of the sexes, certainly there was a huge amount of inequality, but the thought from some of these great revolutionaries was of total equality. And he says, are not women born as free as men? That's what James Otis had to say. Would it not be infamous to assert that the ladies are all slaves by nature? And I think that's a really important starting point when we look at this. We can also look at John Adams, who I mentioned as one of these Jekyll and Hyde type people, but here in 1765, a dissertation on the canon and the feudal law. He says, where did I put this? Rights, he says, I say rights for which they have undoubtedly antecedent to all earthly government, rights that cannot be repealed or restrained by human laws, rights derived from the great legislator of the universe. Richard Henry Lee is another guy over in Virginia. He wrote and he republished. I've talked about John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution, one of his most famous tracks, and it was probably the most widely read at that time until Thomas Paine came along in 1776 with Common Sense. But in response to the hated Townsend Acts of 1767, he wrote a series of letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania. They were published widely in 1767 and 1768. And Richard Henry Lee thought they were so important focusing on principles that he republished them in a Williamsburg edition of the letters in 1769. And he wrote a foreword or an in, uh, introduction to them as well. He says they are, he's talking about how the letters with a force and spirit, they talk about the public liberty, how the invasions of the liberty must be stopped. He says, they are contending for our just and legal possession of property and freedom, a possession that has its foundation on the clearest principles of the law of nature. He didn't say my Fifth Amendment rights to property or uh, my Fourth Amendment rights to not be searched. And certainly those weren't in existence at that time, but he did not cite, these are my magna 
my Magna rights, for example, you know, they didn't talk like that at all. They talked about the rights being your birthright from your creator, from God, from your own nature. And that's incredibly important in how things are played out. Because if government is the one that grants you rights, or if a document grants you rights, then the people who are in charge of that government or in charge in practice of determining how that document is read and applied, then those people can change them over time. And that certainly is how we uh, have things today. So the right to keep and bear arms certainly includes all kinds of restrictions in practice. So does the First Amendment. All these amendments come with all kinds of interpretations because we, the people, we, the people of the several states, we as individuals, so, so many of us in this society look to government for permission first rather than to ourselves. I had a friend, Angela McCardle, who lives here in Los Angeles. She had replied to a tweet that I had put out a couple of days ago, and she basically said, you know, I'm my own, my myself, I am my gun permit. And that's really the best way to put it. Here's George Mason in 1772, and he put it this way. All acts of legislature apparently contrary to natural right and justice are void. This is across the political spectrum for the founders. If we're talking the big government guys from the time of the Constitution, Hamilton, Adams, and the like, and other people like Mason and Richard Henry Lee, they're using the same language. Maybe they had different approaches in how to promote that. Maybe some of them, like Hamilton, were really actually bad guys under it all, but they still use the same language and have the same type of understanding. So did Samuel Adams, one of my favorites. Here he is in the report of the Committee of Correspondence to the Boston Town Meeting on November 20th, 1772. Among the natural rights of the colonists, let me see if I can move this over. It looks like the edge is kind of off here on the video screen. Hopefully this will work. He said, among the natural rights of the colonists are these. First, a right to life. Secondly, to liberty. So, and I'm gonna get to this right to life as well, because if that's your first natural right, you have to be able to protect your right, right? Second, to liberty. Third, to property. Together with the right to support and defend them in the best manner they can. These are evident branches of, rather than deductions from, the duty of self-preservation, commonly called the first law of nature. And I've got an interesting quote to close this out from decades later, talking about the first law of nature. This is very consistent. A lot of people will tell you, and I know Meharry will talk about this, you can't just say the founders said on so many different things because there are so many different individuals with different viewpoints, but on a few issues, and for example, on natural rights and over a period of decades, we're going back to the 1760s and we'll go all the way through uh, the early 1800s. This happened over and over and over again. And I would be remiss, of course, if I did not mention Thomas Jefferson in summary view of the rights of British Americans, 1774. This is one that I cite almost all the time. A free people, he said claiming their rights, uh, it was in context, a free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature and not as the gift of their chief magistrate. This is about we the people learning to exercise our rights, whether government wants to give us permission to have those rights or not, because as long as you actually sit idly by and allow government to restrict your rights or restrict somebody else's rights because you don't like them or you don't like the product, maybe you don't like a cannabis plant and you don't care that somebody else's rights are violated. You don't like a bump stock, so you don't care if somebody else is blocked from having a kitty toy as you may think it might be. Certainly not anyone listening to this show would think like that, but there are many people who have this attitude. If it's not for me, I don't care. But sooner or later, they're going to use that power against you. So Jefferson said, you're a free people if you claim your rights, if you exercise your rights without permission from government. Now, if government gives you permission as well, well, that's great. It makes it a lot easier, certainly. And uh, as well as Bob Brewer, uh, who regularly watches the show, he focuses on first law, talking about the Declaration of Independence. And for example, here from uh, the Declaration, July 4th, 1776, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Again, it comes from our creator, it comes from our nature. This is a principle of natural rights, not gifts from government. 
Here's the penman of the revolution again. Sometime that year, I have not, I need to find the source link to this because I don't have it handy outside of a, a book length product. But here's how Dickinson put it. He said, our liberties do not come from charters, for these are only the declaration of pre-existing rights. Between him and Jefferson in 1774, these might be my two favorite because they're so clear. It's hard to ignore the meaning of this or miss it. Because if you really want to be free, as, as Jefferson put it in 1774, you have to be free no matter what happens around you. And a more modern take on this might be the great Harry Brown, the late great Harry Brown's book, uh, How to Find Freedom in an Unfree World. It's kind of a helpful way to navigate through uh, what we face today living under the largest empire in history. And Dickinson just pointing out that our rights, again, are not from documents. They are not from government. Now, if we move a little bit further forward to the time when they're debating the ratification of the Constitution or debating in the Philadelphia Convention even, we still see this same strain of understanding of natural rights. Luther Martin, this was in the Philadelphia Convention on June 27th, 1787. He said, the first principle of government, this is the first principle, is founded on the natural right of individuals and in perfect equality. He can go back, you could take this and basically superimpose it over what James Otis had to say in 1764. We are all born on with natural rights. That's how we come into this world. We literally have to struggle through, the, through our lives with government attacks on them, but that's how we come into this world. It's not like there's some government official, well, hopefully not, anointing you with the right of free speech or privacy or thought or anything like that. So Luther Martin reinforced this viewpoint at the Philadelphia Convention. No one disagreed with him because this is a pretty obvious statement. It's self-evident. Or, for example, Benjamin Rush, someone who I don't cite often enough, but there's some pretty cool stuff from him. He put it this way. Would it not be absurd to frame a formal declaration that our natural rights are acquired from ourselves... And would it not be more a more ridiculous solecism to say that they are the gift of those rulers whom we have created and who are invested by us with every power they possess? So he's basically saying the, exactly the same thing that I'm saying. And I hadn't actually seen this quote until this past week. I'd never actually read this. So as I was doing some research... I'm like, okay, I think I've got maybe 10 good ones that I want to cover. Oh, wow, here's Benjamin Rush. I guess i got to add this because one of my favorite sayings and one of the most common memes that we post on our 10th Amendment Center social media channels is just the very phrase, rights are not gifts from government. And for those of you watching the video version of the show or coming to our website, you'll see that that's the cover image on basically every channel. Rights are not gifts from government. And that's exactly how Benjamin Rush put it. I mean, not... Maybe not as clearly, but he basically said it'd be absurd to say that our natural rights come from the people that are delegated powers to do stuff, who only get their authority through our approval. And that was in November of 1787 in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention. One that I cite pretty often as well comes from Theophilus Parsons in early 1788. This was in the Massachusetts Ratifying Convention. He said, no power was given to Congress to infringe on any one of the natural rights of the people. And as I mentioned, talking about that first law of nature, here's St. George Tucker. He was one of the leading legal minds. He wrote the first kind of book-length treatise on the Constitution's original meaning in the early 1800s. Here he is in his own Blackstone's commentaries. He said, the right of self-defense is the first law of nature. Let's go back to, let's see if I can find this one from Samuel Adams again. Where are you, Samuel Adams? Here he is, the rights of colonists in 1772. These are evident branches of, rather than deductions from the duty of self-preservation. So in order to have life, once you have life, to have liberty, and then from, to have liberty to get property, you need to be able to have self-preservation. And that's why 30 years later, it was still the same mentality, undisputed. When this came out, when this book was released, 
No one was like, oh, this Tucker guy, he's kind of a wackadoo. He's got some crazy ideas. Right to self-defense is the first law of nature. No, this is the things that they had been talking about for decades. So the people of the several states were well aware of this. And that's probably why government, at least for a while, was, was restricted to some degree. And these days, very few, if any people, very few people hold this type of a view uh, and that's probably why government does whatever is best, supposedly the best, to make the country great or best for the most amount of people. Or America first rather than liberty first, the Constitution first. And St. George Tucker put that so clearly when he said the right of self-defense is the first law of nature. And in a hat tip to what today is commonly called the non-aggression principle. I think it probably originated back from Locke. But here's a letter again from Thomas Jefferson to Francis Gilmer on the 7th of June, 1816. He put it this way, no man has a natural right. So if you're talking about natural rights, can you just do anything? That's going to be one of the arguments. And maybe Jefferson heard this back then as well. Oh, so you're talking about natural rights. So you got a natural right to stab me? I mean, you'll hear some of the most twisted arguments from people who are just ignorant of how this plays out, because you have to tie it in with natural law as well. So Jefferson put it this way. He said, no man has a natural right to commit aggression on the equal rights of another. Well, looking over in the live chat, I saw a bunch of people leaving some comments here. Uh, Brilliant Radiance pointed out natural law as well. Archangel for Truths is great, great live feed. I appreciate it. Uh, Randall Lint says, will you post some links to this message, which is awesome. What I will do over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty, Randall, we have all of our archives of all of our shows. So sometime about an hour or so after this live broadcast is done, when all the other video channels are done processing, I post this on the website, uh, on our website at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And I'll include links to all these quotes where I have original source documents. Primarily, I really want you guys to start out, if you really want to do some reading, reading this page over at the Online Library of Liberty on natural law and natural rights. I think that's a really good start. Or if you want to buy a book, Novus Ordo Seclorum is an incredible one that talks about this original kind of viewpoint which led to the Constitution. It isn't totally focused on natural rights, but it's a very, very important and a really good read. Uh, Pretty interesting stuff, too. Patricia Dance, you're absolutely correct when you say most people beg for servitude. For example, uh, you know, I'm in favor of, for example, constitutional carry. I am not in fan, and I call it that. I gotta stop. I gotta figure out a better way to do this. Maybe essential freedom was helping me out. I was on an episode with the philosopher recently, and trying to come up with better ways to call products rather than assault weapons, and then having to explain that it's a bad term, or pointing out that an AR is really a civilian style, and not talk about military style weapons. But I really got to get better at covering this. But I like the idea of constitutional carry. I just don't like the term because it basically reinforces this idea that you have the right to keep and bear arms or to carry because of the Constitution, not because you're a human being. And the first law of nature says you have a right to self-preservation, to life, the right to life, liberty and property. And you can't have life if you can't defend yourself. You can't have property because someone might come and take it from you if you can't defend yourself. Elaine Garcia, you're so correct. We say public schools will never teach these topics. And this is another example of something I'm trying to change for myself. I want to call them government schools because I think public schools, for many people, their initial thought is, of course, this is for the people. So I just, not to hammer on you, but I think this is just an important point as I'm getting into these are areas where I want to improve myself. That's a really, really good example. Timothy Martin, you're absolutely correct when you mentioned this should be called permitless carry. And Mike Meharry has been very good. T.J. Martinell in their reports for our website often call it permitless carry or concealed carry. No uh, permission is required. Chris Reagan says, I may be wrong, but I could swear the Constitution said people are more inclined to suffer an overbearing government rather than to form a better one. And there's a great uh, uh, piece on this from the conscience of the American Revolution. Her name was Mercy Otis Warren. She talks about obedience. And I'm not sure if I've actually covered this, but I should at some point. There's a free version of it on the online Library of Liberty, but she talks about how human beings, even though they see government doing a lot of bad things, 
when life is not real difficult, they'll tend to just obey. And it only in rare situations where they're pushed to such a state of misery, she described it something like that, will they actually resist. Christina Step, this is great proof our natural rights come from God. Andrew Nappy, I prefer Carrie as well. Oh, I think, Chris, you were talking about the Declaration rather than the Constitution. Interesting. Okay. Just going a little further back in the live chat. Chris Ann Hall, Jeremy D. McAlpin says, Chris Ann Hall teaches a class on the genealogy of the Constitution. I have not seen this. I've heard a lot of people mention this. I consider Chris Ann a friend when she's in town. We usually go get something to eat with her, her husband and her kid, and it's always good to hang out with her. And I don't spend enough time watching my friends or listening to their show. So I appreciate you mentioning that, uh, Jeremy. How it comes from the documents as far as back as the 1100 Charters of Lib Liberty, the 1215 Magna Carta, and the 1641 Grand Remonstrance. That's really interesting. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you very much. Devin Downs says, this would probably be a whole separate episode if it wasn't covered already, but there was an interesting on and off debate at Law and Liberty about the relationship, if any, on the Declaration and the Constitution. I think that would make an excellent, an excellent episode. We have one article on our website talking about this relationship between the Declaration and the Constitution. There are some people who we could call declarationists who see the Declaration as the first law and therefore is binding law. It is required to look to the Declaration, in essence, in how to interpret government power under the Constitution. There are other people who reject it, but that's a great idea. That's a great idea to uh, cover on an episode at some point. Shane Lackey says, Make America States Again. Oh, yeah, we're talking about Joe's book. It's pretty cool. Anyways, I'm rambling on. I'm going to go look through sometime a little bit later today. I will scroll through the rest of the comments through the live feed. And if you've got additional comments later on in the archive, please do consider continue leaving those comments. Smash the like button, subscribe, get bell notifications, leave reviews, all of that free stuff. All the platforms you happen to be watching or listening on, all that free stuff triggers the algorithm. They're very easily triggered, and it tells the platform to show the program to more people. So I'm very grateful for the reviews on iTunes, Podbean, and elsewhere, people who are liking on Facebook, people who are subscribing and liking on YouTube and elsewhere, retweeting, Periscope, and on and on. And of course, if you really, really want to kick in, you can pick up one of these shirts, or you can, which is my Jefferson nullification is the rightful remedy. They called nullification a natural right of the people of the several states. That would Madison and Jefferson called it a natural right. But you can also go to 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members and sign up for a membership for as little as two bucks a month. We also have annual lifetime five-year programs. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I really enjoy talking about this stuff. I think it's so incredibly important. I hope you learn something that's more important than anything. We all have to learn and grow every single day. A reminder, I will not be doing a show next week, Monday. That is... The 2nd of March, I believe. I've got a buddy in from out of town who's on tour, so I'm definitely going to spend the day with him, but I'll be back for my regular schedule. So I'll be here Friday and then next week, Wednesday and Friday. Again, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, and have a great day. I'll see you next time here on The Path to Liberty.